Paul. Julia. Brenda. Lockie. Michael. Will. Becky. Morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Well, it's the same old, same old. Get sick of the same, same old thing over and over again. But we've got to point it out somehow, I guess. What we point about out is non duality, or what they call in the Veda, one without a second, only that. And uh, and we need to realise or recognise that. Or oh, God. They call it God. And they say God's the creator of everything. Well, what the fuck do we want to realise <laughs> if he's created us? Is he ignoring us or are we ignoring him? <laughs> Bloody bullshit, isn't it? So it is to recognise this one essence that's patterning, shaping, forming expressing as everything, and it is only the one. Uh, if it was really God, he'd get mixed up as atheist bastards who don't want to have anything to do with him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that is all there is, and we know that. Because most of the scriptures will tell you that I am that. That is what I am. That is all there is. As Moses on the mountain realised when he's got the Jewish people there, he's got to, they're playing up a bit, he's got to keep, give them some order to live by, so he sits and miser- sits quietly for a while and tablets came to him, Ten Commandments. He says, hey, that'd be a good thing to live by, but I've got to tell them. When I go back to they won't take any notice of me, else shall I say sent me? And it came to him then and then, tell them I am sent you. I am is my name. And that's what you'll see in most of the scriptures. I am that. And what we don't realise that everything is that. That's the chair you're sitting in. That's the carpet. That's the tree. That's the flower. That's the space. That's the room. Everything is that. And the I am we take to be the person, the separate entity instead of realising that it's the one essence, the one intelligence energy that's vibrating, patterning, shaping, forming and expressing as everything. Only the one life, the one essence. And uh, the definition of reality is that which never changes. So what is it that never changes in this manifestation? When you investigate and look into it, the only thing that never changes is space. Can you find the beginnings of space? You can't find anywhere where it could begin. They say it began with the Big Bang. If it began with the Big Bang, what was the Big Bang in? It'd have to be in space, wouldn't it? Space is no thing. And can you postulate or think of anything that could be outside of space? And you realise it can't. And some of the great, the, the real texts and scriptures will tell you. It's the basic space of phenomena. Phenomenal manifestation and the definition of phenomena is that which appears to be. And all this manifestation is appearance and it's all the content of space. So what it appears in is space. Space is no thing. It hasn't got a beginning, any ending, no shape, no form, no divisions, no patterns, or anything at all. It just is that. And 
I, you, and everything else is that. And that's the great mantra, I am that. Innately you know that. Immediately because I say, that's the chair I'm sitting in, that's the carpet, that's the tree, that's the flower, that's the sea, that's the stars. Everything is already that. But we're differentiated by the words we picked up. How many words were you born with? And you realise the words, you weren't born with any words. You didn't learn words until you were a couple of years old when the capacity of reasoning developed you. Where did you, how did you come about? We'll start with your father and your mother, that any minute like this is that pattern you call your father, and that pattern through the food he's eaten and the <coughs> energy and prana and things of reading through, enabled in that pattern a little basic thing called a sperm to form. You can't see it with your naked eye. But that sperm was suffused with intelligence. It knew what to do. And the same in your mother, that having that life as was in your mother. Then able in that pattern, another microscopic kind of called an egg or an ovum to form. And that egg attached itself to the wall of the uterus. And the sperm swam to the ovum. Being it wasn't just a blob of goo, it knew what to do. And it penetrated the ovum. And the life essence intelligence in those two coming together formed the little embryo. The little fetus is what you are today. What were you doing about it then? And what are you doing about it now? So it was that life that when those two, after nine months, that little two pattern formed the little embryo, the little fetus, which is what you are today naturally and effortlessly. But what happens then? You weren't born with any words. So whether you say so or not, you cannot put, remember your birth. How could you if you had no words? And you didn't learn any words until you were a couple of years old when the capacity of reasoning developed in you and you learned words for your parents, father and your mother, fussing around you, speaking words, and you learnt the basic word, I am. Because they put the name on your little Johnny or little Jean or whatever your name might be. I am little Johnny or I am little Jean. And we've taken that to believe that what, that's what I am, the word. And when you look at the word, the word's not the thing. Take the word water, can you drink the word? Can you swim in it or drown in it? Take the word fire. Can you cook with it, eat yourself with it? You can't. What's the word well, I or me then? Just another concept, a word. It tells you in the Bible, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, the word was God. That's all that God is, is a word. All things were made by him, by the word. And there was nothing made that was made without the word. You can read, read that in the Bible, it tells you that. So we've learnt words. We've taken this word, God, to be a greater, something greater than what we are. But there again, when you look into these, some of these texts and scriptures that are understood, it, they'll call it the great perfection or the absolute. Now, if it's absolute, that means that there's nothing could add to it, nothing taken away from it. It's just as it is. Or in Buddhism they call it the great perfection. It's the same with the perfect. You can't add anything to the perfect. You can't take anything away from it. Now have a look at that. If you recognise you are the absolute, who can be superior to you? If it's absolute totality, nothing can be superior to you. Who could be inferior to you? Another thing, well, nobody can be inferior to you. And what would you want from anybody else? Nothing. But you see, we've taken ourselves to be these persons, these separate entities. And we want this and want that and haven't got this. They're better than me or worse than me. And we're always looking to acquire or attain or gather something other. Not realising or recognising 
that I am already that. That is what I am. This presence awareness. And they don't know that when they talk about the Advaita teachings, Satchit Ananda, Nama Rupa, existence, consciousness, bliss, name and form. Anyone who is not existing right now, you'll say, yeah, well, I'm existing, of course I am. Anyone who is not conscious or unaware, and you know you're not unaware or unconscious. Anyone who's not happy to be, well, nobody wants to be dead right now. No matter how bad life is, you don't want the end of it right now. So you already are that. And the other two factors, Nama Rupa, name and form, they'll tell you it's Maya. The body mind, the name and form is Maya, it's illusion. But the existence, consciousness, bliss or loving to be, is the actuality. And that's what you all are already. But we've taken on this belief that we are the separate entity, the person, and think if we do this and look into that and follow this or believe in that, we will become something other than what we are. Well, what's becoming? Becoming implies a future time. And when you look into the times, the concepts of time, you'll see there's no such thing as time. Is there a past if you don't think about it? You'll say, I was in the past. But can you go back and live a week ago or last year or even a moment ago? You can't. You can recall some of it and can't recall it all. Only what you can recall, you can give some energy to and that doesn't last long. And all that can't be, that's happened and can't be recalled, well, it's not there anymore. And you can't live a moment in the future. You can anticipate and imagine the future time. But you can't live in the future. So all you've got left is this now. And have a look at that. Can you grasp this now? Well, it's now, right now. And it's still now, as I'm saying now. It's got no duration to it. It's always this spontaneous presence awareness. Not a past awareness or a future awareness. Are you unaware right now? And you'll say, no, I'm not unaware right now. And you are that awareness. And what's awareness? Not a concept. It's a pure certainty or knowing of being. It's awareness of being. And that's another way they put such in an end. Awareness of being is the bliss. Sense of well-being when you're there. Sense of everything's okay. There is nothing wrong anymore. But while I'm living in this conceptual pattern, shapes and forms, it's only me who can be angry. It's only me who can be jealous, envy, fearful, anxious or depressed, guilty. Me is the cause of all the psychological suffering. I look into this me and ask, what is this me? I realise me, or I, is just a concept, a word I picked up along the way. And uh, when her parents told me, you are, I am Billy or Jane, or whatever the name was up there, so instead of saying, I am the absolute, we've taken on that belief and believe ourselves to be this separate entity that's got to become realised or recognised. Not rec realised or recognising that that is all there is and I am already that. And Christ told you that when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. People thought he was talking about himself. He wasn't talking about himself, he was talking about that sense of presence. It expresses through the mind as the thought I had. Now what are you this person? When you look at the word person, come, where does that word come from? A word we've hooked up along the way, coming from the Latin persona, the mask. 
So it's a market mask of concepts we've taken of life, our thoughts or ideas, image, and believe ourselves to be that mask of concepts. Instead of realising that I am that life, I am being, I am knowing, and I am happening to be. And have a look at that word being. You call yourself a human being. If you believe in God, you'll call God the supreme being. Take away that word supreme, take away that word human. Try and tell me you're not being without those words. Realise the beingness is there. It is empty to put human or supreme on it. It's just pure being. And being is not becoming. And it won't be becoming. We try to become something. Their becoming implies a future time. And time is a mental concept. There is no past unless you think about it. And there's no future unless you think about it. And Shakespeare tells her that a hundred years ago and he says, there's nothing good either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Look at the way we think. We're always thinking in the related phase of opposite. Either past or future, pleasant or painful, happy, sad, loving, hating, positive, negative, always in the opposites. And there is nothing told you good or bad but thinking makes it so. So we put the belief into it and it's good or it's bad and see how that functions in your life. Something comes up and you like it and the things you like you don't want to go away not realizing that this manifestation is transient it's constantly changing always changing constantly but we don't want the good to go away, not realising that it is transient, no matter how much you love it, how much you're going to keep from there, they're going to change and they will change, just the same as that body you're sitting in right now is changing, it's transient also but we don't want it to change, so what do we do? We resist it from change trying to keep it there and realise that resistance is conflict if you're resisting this change that wants to come about, you were in conflict. And that conflict will make you fearful, anxious, depressed, guilty. And that puts you up, makes you uneasy. So there's resistance, conflict and disease coming up. The other way around, something you don't like. Oh, I shouldn't be thinking that. That's terrible of me to think that. Oh, good, I've got to get rid of it. So we resist it again. A more conflict and more disease. So you see, no wonder we're all this psychological mess all the time because we're constantly relating to it and resistance to it. And relativity relationship is duality. There is absolutely no duality in non-duality. And we've got this male-female relativity and there's a belief in that duality separation. No wonder we're in constant problems. But when there's a natural merging, a natural coming together and understanding that it is life itself that's recognising itself and joining with itself, a different take on it all together. But while we're in conflict, there's fear, there's anger, there's distress, guilt, shame, remorse, all these things are there. Me is the cause of all my psychological suffering. And the effects are the anxiety, the fear. Cause and effect. Isn't that what so-called karma is? Cause and effect. What happened if I looked into it and asked myself, can there be a cause, can there be an effect if I'm not relating to the cause? If I recognise the cause, me as a fiction, where can the effect lie? You can recognise without relating to the cause me, there cannot be the effect. So everything settles down to it as it is. So there's your answer. How many of us do that? We don't. So look into the 
who am I? Investigating this idea. Am I this body? Am I this mind? Am I this person? Well, have a look at the body. Am I my, this body? Well, don't you say my body? My mind? My house? My car? My coat? You know you're not the house, the car or the coat. Well, by the same token, maybe you're not the body either. And when you look into it, what's this body made up of? And you realise it's made of elements. Air, earth, fire, water, space. Take the air out of your body and see how long it lasts. Take the water, you die of thirst. Take the body temperature, time of hypothermia level. Get off the earth, get out of space. So you realise when you're looking at things, you're not separate from any of those things. And that sense of separation is a fiction. Well, all those elements can be broken down into subatomic particles, into pure energy. All this body is a vibrating pattern of energy. What about the thing called mind? Say, my mind. Well, show me a mind if you can. When you look at it, there's no such thing as mind apart from thought. And if I, mind is thought, which particular thought am I? You realise the primary thought is I am. Now if you were that thought, and you believe you are the thought, you were that thought, you wouldn't let go of it. You'd be frightened of losing it, because you know without that thought, that would be the end of you. If you are the thought in mind, that we cling to it, that we gladly give it up every night when we go to sleep. That proves that innately you know you're not the thought. And the Shakespeare tells you there's nothing either good or bad but thinking makes you so, you might have something there, look into it and see that it's so. And it's always but divided in, in the interrelated opposites. But if it's not you or me, what is it? It's just as it is. And what is is not was. It's not in time anymore, it's out of time. It's just as it is. It's not what will be or what was. It just is. Anybody who is not present or aware, that presence or awareness or isness is right with you right now. So what needs to happen? Just a matter of recognising. They call it a cognising emptiness in Buddhism. We think we cognise the emptiness. We don't. The emptiness itself is cognising. There is an innate knowing there of cognising. And the Buddha told you that when he said emptiness is form. All these forms, you and I are forms, and all this manifestation of form. He says the emptiness is form, and he says the forms can be nothing other than the emptiness. So so it looks real, you'll see it's all patterning, shaping and forming. It's all appearance, a phenomenal manifestation. And the definition of phenomena is that which appears to be. And appearance means it's only seemingly so. And you know that yourself when you look out there in nature. You're so, you've recognised that so many of the so-called appearances are not how they seem to be. You go down to the ocean, I'll say, get me a bucket of blue water out of the sea. You've got a, what appears to be a blue sea there. And you won't be able to get a bucket of blue water out of it because the water's not blue. The same on a clear day out there, the clear sky. There's a blue canopy over the sky. Sky is space. Space right here in this room, where's the blueness? You go up in the place, go up in the plane, 30, 40 thousand feet. The blueness will always be further out. So it's not how it appears to be. And you see a rainbow in the sky, colours in the sky. And all when you look at it, you see it's only the sun shining through the cloud, through the mist, that forms colours on the background. So there's a a lot of things when they talk about the snake and the rope and many other metaphors they use to point out the erroneous belief we have about this manifestation. <coughs> so these things need to be questioned and looked at and seen for what they are. And the recognition that I am that, I am, the sense of presence, 
which translates and expresses through the mind as the thought I am. It's not the thought, but the sense of presence, which translates as the thought. And they say the great perfection is non-conceptual awareness. Awareness without any concepts or words. And words and thoughts and concepts and ideas are just translations of how it appears to be so. And the recognition that I am that, what's there? There's a sense of there's nothing wrong anymore. A sense of being well. A clarity. A cognizing emptiness sense of love or well-being, being well. And all the concepts, the hate, the jealousy, the envy and all the rest, disappear. Because if it's only the one essence, if I am absolute, then nothing superior to me, nothing inferior to me. And what would I want from anybody else? And that's the life. And that is what I am. And it is what you are. It is what everything is. It is the one thing that pattern shapes and forms and expressing it and appears as everything. And that is all there is. So, some of you here recognize this already, and they'll ask you, they'll tell you about it and put it in a different way, what you might hear there, where something might resonate with you and make it a bit clearer. Others here have had doubts and questions. Well, if the paper might answer them for you, don't hesitate to ask questions. But the thing is to get into it and have a look, question, doubt and argue if you've got them, or if you've recognised and it has dawned on part of you, let it out because it's only if some, it is expressing and somebody else is open enough that can hear it and resonate with it. And that's how it moves on. Not by having, thinking you're going to get it by sitting in silence and looking at this, that and the other. Got to recognise the reality of it, that one essence, the life, the beingness, that's expressing as everything. And you are that. So, Cat. home she lives here we have to respect her <laughs> uh, so this is the part of the meeting where we invite everyone to speak to ask questions to share uh, the best way to go about it is to actually share what you heard what resonated what really rang the bell what the body responded in like full yes because one pointer is enough to hear actually just one and that one pointer, every single pointer, can just bring you all the way home. Because it really is about dropping away excessive concepts and ideas that actually stand in the way. They run the shoulder cuts here, they're not cool. <laughs> Uh, so anyone would like to start and share something, say something, ask something? Um. <laughs> the wand matches. It's great. Um, the thing I think I hadn't heard you say today, Bob, is such a simple pointer, but you said, now is now. <laughs> and it's like, the, you don't have to go anywhere to find, like the thing that, I'm looking for, I guess that we're all looking for is right 
now. It's not, there's nowhere else to go. It's just acknowledging that this is it and that's all there is. And there's just a, like a, oh gosh, don't have to worry. Don't have to be like go searching or make a plan or how to get there because it's just right now. So, um, yeah, that just rang the bell today. Yeah, beautiful. Take it, take it as yours. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. And it, and it is the point at which unfolds all the way mm. because it's so uncompromising. Mm. You can see how the past is also happening right now as the memory, mm. how the future is happening right now as the imagination. Yeah. It's nothing but the now. And this is also when uh, Ariel is saying, roll call. Is there anybody here who is not present? That's what she heard, and thank you for that, Ariel. Yes, it is the presence that is already here. <laughs> hmm. it's, it's nothing to be added. It's, uh, yeah. it's just to recognize of what is always and forever here. And what Bob always says is, nobody can give that to you, and nobody can show you that. They just point to that obvious thing, you're already here, here, mm, that's right now. Right. Nobody can give that to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. <laughs> no? No? Yeah, spontaneous, isn't it? Just spon the spontaneity, that was a word that stuck with me. Mm. What a beautiful word that is. Everything is spontaneous now. Bang, you just have to rest in that, don't we? What a beautiful thing. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. I remember when I heard that pointer probably some good 12 years ago or something. And that precisely that word spontaneous. And I was going around, still living in my head, obsessing about it. And every time it would kick in, it would just relax the obsession. It's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful quality in that non quality sort of a presence. Spontaneity is, 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 is a quality of the appearance. Mm. Yeah. And, and once you see, again, this is the pointer that takes you all the way, because if everything is spontaneous, where there is any place for you and me or anyone else to control anything whatsoever, it's just are the space, holding a space for that spontaneity to roll, for the Maya to dance. Mm. Beautiful. Mm, I want to talk about everything else. <laughs> Go, yeah. go for it. <laughs> no, 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 anyone else? Yeah, um, Ross, did you? Um, <coughs> I just what came to mind was um, uh, fixation on ideas, mm. and in that little book um, Bob wrote, uh, there's a example of when you uh, use a magnifying glass and focus on the skin it burns yeah. it's like the fix fixation of ideas so that takes us out of the present seemingly out of the present and we're in the past or we do we're worried about the future uh, instead of just letting go and then the natural state comes into view. Mm. But that is, that is a beautiful highlight because you can easily see how fixation on ideas is the only problem you can ever have. Because in the present moment as it is, there is no problem unless there is a thought that it should be different or it will get worse or whatever other thought. And fixation, belief in that thought, creates a hell, creates a misery, suffering. Even if the present moment is not particularly pleasant, but there is no thought or no idea that it should be any different, there is no suffering. There may be pain, but not a suffering, not a resistance, not psychological suffering. Fixation on ideas, yeah. That one pointer, again, it can bring you all the way home. Just noticing how the mind gets fixated. In the moment of noticing, there is natural relaxation because the mind can't notice that it got 
fixated, just like the eye can't see itself and the fire can't burn itself. The noticing is the ing, is the noticing, just like a seeing. It's not I that is seeing, it's the seeing, and within that seeing is the I and the object. In that noticing is the mind that is, that is uh, being noticed. Anyone? Any other pointer? <laughs> they all so elegant. They all so simple and beautiful. I never actually heard, even when I was a seeker and I was listening to everyone I could, I never s found anyone who would that beautifully and elegantly put it in one-liners like Bob. Kavisha? Um, it just reminds me of a story of Mira, um, the Mira who was um, a wise woman ancient times in India and she was outside in the dark looking 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 and people said Mira what are you looking for I'm looking for my needle she said I'm looking for my needle she says your needles in your house like why are you looking out here he goes haha that's what I'm showing you this is what you're doing you're looking for the needle outside the house <laughs> by being a seeker you, it's actually in it's uh, mm -hmm. so she was laughing at them, so she was dem making fun of them by doing that. Yeah, beautiful. How, how true, how true the whole quest, a human quest for happiness, is usually either the quest trying to find God or trying to find oneself. But we all look in the wrong places. <laughs> Even, you know, people go for their silent retreats to the other side of the country or the world or the fasting to find themselves. How could you get rid of yourself? But I think that's important. I think mm. actually it's important to do that because well, we have to, it's like netty netty. Yeah. We have to find the things. Mm. And um, I have to say, the first time I ever did say Vipassana, that was really important for me because, say, our conditioning, you know, with school and, you know, the church and the, the parents, the society and everything, is so antithesis of that. And it was the first time I actually got to sit down mm. and be with myself as myself. I, th I, I do think there's a place, like, it's, until you go through that journey, it's really hard to appreciate this. But I, you I think it's you important. Can't that's the point. You can't choose to go or not to go. The moment you put the idea that this is important, maybe you can st start telling others this is what you have to do. But there is no one there who has any choice. How the, how the particular life book unfolds, whether you have to go through the alcoholism and you can say, oh, but this was important that I had to go through that because without it I wouldn't have suffered. So it is how it unfolds, but there is really no one who could choose you were, you know, like the life force in you was attracted to Vipassana. I've done a few of those too, and they were brilliant, beautiful. I this is how the life very unfolded. Important, although I, I do think sometimes, <laughs> thinking, I think it's thinking, important yes. not to be too smart ass about, yes, it's now, and everyone <laughs> else is a fool because they're going on these retreats, but they're not fools because they, they have every, no choice. There's everyone's no on a journey, and you've got to respect that too. That, that's the point. If you believe that there is someone who is smarter than the other because they did something or the other, mm. you believe that there's someone there. You know, if you look from the True. ultimate perspective, there is life. You know, one cat will live in a house, another one will live on the street in India. And they, neither of them has any choice. Your attraction towards the retreats, and I've done them too, there was an, a natural attraction. And Bob did something else. Everyone is kind of, you know, like that one life outputting through everyone is finding its own flow. But there's no one who has the choice and it's not that I've done it, th I've done it right and those who didn't do it have done it wrong. Or they who didn't do it right and those who did did it wrong because no one has any saying. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. That no one is ever wrong in anything. No one is ever guilty of anything. Because there's no one there. Mm. 
and, and, and you're totally right. It's so beautiful to go through all the, you know, Bob had the Kundalini experiences, the most incredible peak experiences, cosmic unions of people who have psychedelic experiences. They're just such a gorgeous highlights of, the, of that dream that we all collectively living. It's, all of it is totally to be appreciated. In, in fact, if there is any reason for all the manifestation to even exist at the first place, it would be for the life to actually see the reflection of itself and love it and appreciate it. Mm. All of it is nothing, nothing wrong. Even, you know, finding yourself in a prison cell for a crime that you allegedly have done and that was a wrong thing. <laughs> all of it. Well, but now it's everywhere. It is. So yeah. Eternal. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. <coughs> One thing that resonated a lot for me today was uh, I am life. Or just rec just kind of going into the heart and recognising oh, I am that. Which is not, if you're r regularly in a sense of superior or inferior in some way, that's kind of this um, this experience where it's like, oh, I'm included, or I feel um, at ease, or, you know. So, yeah, mm. I, can't, I can't remember if you said that exact phrase today, Bob, but, uh, but that's what kind of sunk in or deepened or something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. He said it in many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, he said it in a way that there is a sperm in ovum and the life, that life force that made them come together and divide. It's all life behind everything. Recognizing that you are that life, expressing and experiencing as every moment. That's, yeah, that's the final realization. Mm -hmm. what, what else is to realize, really? Just stay with that. <laughs> See if we have any comments, and we do. Uh, Ariel says, uh, "I agree, Kat. Bob's spiel is so simply spoken and so completely encompassing. It landed here in this being quite profoundly, for some reason. Yeah, it was beautiful to witness that. Uh, Vipassana was very useful here. It is brilliant." And Gilbert said, that was from Laura. Yeah, I agree. It was uh, quite an adventure. Hey? What, is that? what does Gilbert have to say? And <laughs> Gilbert <laughs> says, <laughs> uh, I am he doer is the illusion of separation. Yep. And that's that. <laughs> I did this pasana as well, and I was told that I might have to do um, 10 more retreats or 20 and then come back and serve, and then I might have to do a thousand lifetimes okay. before I awaken. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that, was, I thought that was funny. I think, really? I have to do all of that? Yeah. <coughs> and then they banned me because. Um, <laughs> you rebel, you rebel. <laughs> I got kicked out. I was told not to come back. You I'd were talking too much. <laughs> no, I didn't talk. I don't. It's because I do hypnotherapy, and they oh. said that when you retire, you're welcome to come back. Wow! Now I, speak, oh, yes. now I was speaking to someone about that, and they said, mm. "Oh, um, just don't tell them. Tell them you've retired." So I went to apply for another vis partner, and they said, "No, you're still working." So I've been banned. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't either. That's the human mind. <laughs> and I don't know. I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't. I behaved. <laughs> yeah, they do it because because it's such a it's them. such a usually it's a big gathering. They do have restrictions. Like if you have mental illness, they do have to also select you out. And uh, hypnotherapy, no, it is it is just it's obviously I, I was there in addition. But hypnotherapy mm. is also some sort of a mind altering practice, which yeah. they uh, they believe actually 
uh, I, I loved how clean and pure the mm. vipassanas I've been four times mm. I've, I've attended but every time I made the point to ask the teachers how clear they are mm. and they said no they're not how long do you practice 30 years 40 mm. years 25 mm. years and are you enlightened mm. no 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 it does mm. no it doesn't work this way Mm. And <laughs> I wish I could come back there and <laughs> say, hey, you what are, you now? just don't know it. <laughs> you just don't realize that you're looking for something different than yeah. this moment. And this moment, the moment you put mm. the mind aside, is the natural state, is the Buddha nature. Is mm. There is no escape from that. It's just a recognition mm. that is missing. Mm. And I remember when I did my introduction to non-duality in India, and I, was, I had the uh, meditation in which... Uh, the elements of vipassana were used but they were taken to the next level because there was much 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 more to include in the observation but there was always a flip look at the one and try to locate the one who is observing the sensations mm. Mm. if you can locate that one because sometimes you can maybe behind your eyes or in the heart whatever whatever the mind will come up with it's a brilliant improviser which always comes up with the answer as you know from the hypnotherapy mm. Uh, if you can locate that one, find the one who has located the one. Mm. And then stepping back very, very quickly, there is no one to locate or to be located. And then I remember uh, crying after that 20 minutes. I said, shit, you know, so many days and hours of Vipassana and that little instruction was mm. kind of missing. Mm. And that was the first breakthrough to actually see the non-dual awareness when everything landed, that there is no separate self mm. who can be located anywhere. And then later on, of course, habitually, the mind would reveal the identity. And without the repeated questioning, the identity would stack. Mm. But yeah, you can't say what was and what wasn't necessary or important in whatever the life unfolded. Because why argue? Why even judge? That's how it pan out. I love when Bob answers that on the interview. You know, when he says that's how it unfolded. He went through incredible ups and downs in all the areas of life, including health, finances, love life, spiritual life, all of it. That's how it pan out. Is it necessary? No. Does it have to be replicated? Absolutely not. There are people in Brazil who let themselves be nailed to the cross because they want to have the experience of Christ. In Philippines. Or in Philippines, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, that's how, how, uh, that's how it unfolds. Yeah, life is so incredibly creative. We have another comment here from uh, Larry. Simply come back to the wakefulness. Uh, Bob and Gilbert often use that pointer. It is not that wake wakefulness there as that which is appearing as retreats, bars, kundalini experiences, and bad sex. Raise your hand if you are unawake. <laughs> Beautiful, Larry, thank you. Yeah, come back to the wakefulness, it's <laughs> always there. And uh, if you are asleep, then of course, instruction doesn't apply, there's no problem. And Julia, uh, British Julia, is laughing and say 25,000 more lifetimes. <laughs> Once it is seen, it is so simple and clear. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You see the thought as a thought, the idea, concept. Not now, not this, not this is me. All concepts, they're all equal. They're flat. They're just line of text. And Gilbert says, there is no final realization or final understanding. Life is spontaneous and everything is spontaneously fresh and new. Nothing repeats itself. How wonderful is that? Mm. Yeah. And there is, of course, you know, if there was a final realization, who would be there to have it? <laughs> if there is no self to have it, it's just life. Life is all there is. It's singular. Is one in thousand different forms, ten thousand forms, whatever, infinite. And Bradley says, uh, the I am is gifted with thinking, then thinking makes I am an object. Then the parasite convinces that host that it's the parasite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like the, the analogy of the, you know, the I, the, mm, the imagined self that is hallucinated in particular part of the brain, some language center of the brain, 
is sort of a virus in a system, although it is a little bit of a pejorative uh, perspective which would deny the brilliance of the absolute. It's not. It is. You can call it a virus as a pointer, but there is a brilliance even in that installment of that hallucinated sense of separate self, because without it there would be no realization that there is no self. Everything is experienced only on the background of its opposite. That cat is living permanently in the natural state, and it takes it for granted. It never know any better. It has never ever been caged in the concepts. As far as we know, they don't hallucinate separate self. That's that. Just on that vipassana, the word means uh, seeing within, pashan to see and we within. So it's insight, insight meditation. And there, there are two, st in the West, there's two strands of this. There's one, the most popular is the um, Goenka strand and um, the original version was Sayaji Ubakin, a Buddhist teacher from Burma. Um, and the, and the, the difference is in the approach to it. So Goenka is very much effort. Mm. It's all about effort. Uh, Sayaji Ubakin, his approach is work with zestful ease. Mm. So it's just sort of approaching a more relaxed state. Um, but they never really get there because it's all about doing or subtle doing. Oh, yeah. mm. And um, it's only when you completely give up the doing mm. that there's an opportunity to see. Um, the simplicity of it, of just being yeah. consciousness and uh, bliss, happiness to be. Mm. Uh, so the uh, the uh, vipassana is a lovely practice, but it, the fact that we're seemingly in a duality that it's only when you get to a basic level that you can actually have insight and um, appreciate the the beautiful simplicity and naturalness of uh, of the non-dual mm. so it seems yeah, it was actually, uh, it was quite a sad realization for me. Goinka died not that long ago, and I've seen the last interview in which he was actually saying that he did not achieve the great enlightenment or what they call it, and maybe the next lives or something, maybe the merit is accumulating. And, well, in, in one way, okay, that's again how life unfolds. And the, the mind training or the meditation, the concentration training, it has a great value in itself as a life skill. Same as cooking. Cooking has a great value if you can cook. I mean, your life is going to be so much easier. Your sense of freedom is going to be so much greater. Or when you can drive, you know, all those things are a fantastic life skills. But Bob very often, and maybe Bob, you would say it, you know, when he warns people about attaching to a practice because that creates the one, the practitioner, who is to achieve a goal in the future through the practice and effort. <coughs> can you can you say something about it? You often talk about the you know, the meditation as a practice, something to do for someone. Uh, what's wrong with right now if you don't think about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what about, you know, 
the, <laughs> the famous concept of spiritual bypassing. <laughs> hmm? What about it? Uh, nothing, nothing. Honestly, uh, I hear that concept every now and again. And that very concept, the concept of spiritual bypassing, is exactly what it is. It is a spiritual bypassing. <laughs> you are bypassing the basic fact that there is no self that can do anything <laughs> wrong. Anything. Oh, but that self didn't do the therapy. There is no self to do therapy. If you find yourself on the therapist chair doing some sort of a hypnosis or whatever, a shadow work or whatever, that's how life unfolded. If you find yourself not doing it, but instead, you know, singing in a choir or painting mandala or walking in the forest, that's how life unfolded. The idea that there is a me that could do something wrong because it bypassed something is a bypass itself. It's a funny concept because it's so engaging for the mind. So many people suddenly, they've so clear, they understood so many aspects of that simplicity, of that non-dual awareness, and they fall for that crap. <laughs> oh no, there's still this is me, and I didn't do, I didn't work with my inner child, or I didn't do this. Or, well, who is there to do anything at all if life will take you this way? Yeah, yeah, but if I don't, maybe I'll be abusive. Or maybe I will become a guru and will have some, you know, will exercise some powers or, or scam people of money. Well, it may happen this way. Still no self that is responsible or guilty of that things happening. And beautiful that no one wants to be the bad guy. That's really lovely. But no one has a saying. And apparently, at least in my life experience, when I look back, they were people who felt immensely hurt by me because they imagined that what I said meant something different. I couldn't have prevented it, not in a million years. Mm. And there are people who did not get offended when I really slapped their wrists because they were mature enough to actually see that this was what is happening. No one is doing anything. Sometimes I, I remember also the uh, brilliant saying of the 12-step Alanon program. You can't pre prevent the crisis. You shouldn't prevent it. You shouldn't cause it. The truth is you can't do e either of it. You can't prevent it. You can't cause it. But the truth is if we would really have the, the, the will and the power to protect someone from suffering, we could have also protected them from the investigation and eventually from the awakening. Thankfully, we don't have that power. And even having the thought of compassion and love and just easing the suffering and helping is given by life or not. That's how uncompromising, how simple and uncompromising. No one has done a thing. Cool, isn't it? <laughs> We're all forever innocent. <laughs> what? You tell us, Dean. No, no, come no, no, on. No, no, come no, 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 Just recalling um, <laughs> the, the, 16, in the, the 16 stages of Vipassana knowledge as taught by Sir Arjuna Yubakin or, or Goenka. Um, the only one that's not explained is Nirvana. Mm. Nirvana. Because it's can't it can't be explained because it's it's silence. Yeah. No thinking. Just being. And when is it never not here? When is it ever not here? Mm. <laughs> Underlying the noise of thinking. Where is not is that ever absent? Yeah. It's the natural perfection. Mm. Um, you said uh, resistance creates conflict. Yes. The resistance creates conflict. Where does that, like, if you just accept the conflict? That's it. Then yes. wasn't resistance sort of 
ne like necessary or it wasn't really a bad thing and didn't create conflict if you just accept it. Yeah. Yeah. You just recognize that, you know, there is no you to actually create anything or to accept anything. But if you actually see how the identification with the conflict relaxes and now you are the space in which you don't have any objection towards the conflict. That's how the identification dissolves. So to use it in a pointer, when you are identified as a me, I don't want this weather to be like that. Shit, this is all wrong. I want it to be sunny and not raining and cold. That is suffering. But the moment you actually accept that this is how it is, another way to put it is you relax out of that identification with resistance into that space of presence in which there is no objection to the way the weather is. So it's neither acceptance nor rejection of what is. Basically, the identity of me, self, being in conflict, opposing life, is dissolved. And now there is just a space of presence, of cognizing emptiness. No identity. It's not that you don't have to not do anything. Yeah. It's not about completely accepting so you don't do anything. But the state of mind that you're doing, taking action, is not stressful, yeah, doing free, right. free of suffering. Mm. You can still, if someone's after you with an ax, you can run. <laughs> but it means that you're in a flow state as opposed to completely freaked out and totally anxious. So you just allow yourself, take action that you need to take, but you're not mm. crippled by the resistance and anxiety. This shouldn't be happening, you know, it's happening, flow. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah, is that, is doing happens. The, the you're, do, you're doing it naturally, mm. but your mind isn't engaged in this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> when that already is too late, I guess, then you're already having to accept like <laughs> the conflict that's already been made. And it's gone. Every moment, you know? <laughs> too late that moment is gone now is a fresh and new moment in which that thought that it is too late oh i haven't done it five minutes ago i should have accepted it that's gone that's just thinking now is a free new moment and past is dead so now okay okay now oh i haven't oh okay now see how life is leaving you how life brings rejection and how life brings acceptance whatever it is life is lifing the action also comes from that life, the impulse that life gives you to get up or to say something. You don't know what your next thought gonna be. Life will bring it and you will hear it when it's spoken. Or maybe you'll hear it silently before or rehearsed or whatever. But the moment in which you haven't done anything you should have is dead, is gone, forget about it. Yes, Bob, yeah. Bob wants to say something. Let it rest in this uncontrived singularity. Mm. Leave it as it is. One is restful, and the other one has got lots of mind chatter around it. So one is in, in the moment, is there's, this, um, there's more relaxation within the body-mind. It's just an acceptance of the flow. And, and as uh, Kavish was saying, you know, whatever has to be done in the moment gets done. But the other one is the mind, continuous mind story around it. And that's where the suffering is. It's a bit like the commentator at the footy, I reckon. Yeah. So you've got the commentator, the game's happening out there, but there's always this, just behind it all, this yap, 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 yap. <laughs> and that's the... Making us um, ju value judgments on it all. Yeah. Yes. And it doesn't have any impact at all on the play, on the playing. It's but just it noise after the playing. <laughs> yes. And we have, uh, oops, I lost the screen. Uh, Gilbert says, um, no one to accept or reject anything. What is, is what is. Who is going to do reality? Beautiful. And Sol says, resistance arises spontaneously. Even identification with a separate self arises spontaneously. Identification with a person is not personal. Beautiful. Absolutely. There's nothing personal. It's an illusion. <laughs>
Beautiful. Thank you. I think if you do everything 100 percent, that's it. Isn't it? There's no room for any other element to it. The whole story about conflict develops after that fact, doesn't it? That you, you know, that you make something else of it, and that's it. Trying to wreak havoc on the past, which you cannot ever be, can it? It's craziness. And so, in this, the spontaneity of the present moment, having given everything to whatever it was, you can let it go. Be here now. Uh, yeah, there wasn't a better way to put it. Mm. <laughs> Is there a difference between, so like what you were saying, like surrendering, mm. but you still have to feel the conflict, right? Mm. You still have to feel if you're angry, you have to feel it. Or else you're disconnecting from the life force is that that what can you think arise of? too it can by all means i mean life is so completely unlimited in the way it experiences and expresses itself it can experience and express itself through a resistance and a fight and a seeming uh mm. you know like surrender that oh yeah now i remembered and now i'll give up and i will lie down i'll be humbled that narrative is one of the ways life experiences itself but it's no one doing it again it may be what is happening it may be a good description but it is not what necessarily would happen it may be something that i like course in miracles calls a miracle <laughs> it is a sudden shift of perception from that very very strong position of oh i'm right and life is wrong into just Poof! like a soap bubble Poof! Okay. But it might also, because life is unlimited, it might yeah. also be a huge internal struggle and dark night of the soul and whatever, whatever you have. Mm. Okay. Mm. Julia. <coughs> no, I was just thinking about what, what you were talking about with um, things coming up and metaphor that I'd, I'd heard you mention before of... Uh, you might see a bird on the beach, seagull or something, you run up to it, it flies off. But then it goes back and then like a moment later it's, I don't know, looking for food or whatever on the beach as though nothing ever happened. Because it's not, it's not going, oh man, that, that jerk, he scared me. <laughs> and going, going to a story, it just kind of stays with what is. So as, as she was saying, if somebody's coming after you with an axe, you might run. You know, you know, a fear can come up. It's okay. It's it's just um, it doesn't have to be dwelled in. You know, that's that's uh, an option of uh, you could just always come back to here. It's always available. Mm. Beautiful. I have a comment from Tristram. He says, uh, "What really moved me this week was this one from Nisargadatta." When I look inside and see that I am empty, that is wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that is love. Between this, my life turns. Let's see it another translation. <laughs> it's a different translation. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's equally close. Empty, when, when I, I see I'm empty or I see I'm full, or I see I'm nothing and I see I'm everything. It's just still in that particular tr translation, it's still that I that is seeing something but there are translations when the eye is completely out of the picture when i'm nothing this is wisdom when i'm everything this is love that is without the i am seeing this i am seeing that uh, either way it's a beautiful description it's just a description of the natural state in which for anything to be experienced there have to be a flow so in nisargadatta's case this flow between the uh, love and wisdom, wisdom uh, or emptiness and fullness, being everything or being nothing. And that sort of a poetic description is uh, his way of putting it. And Linda says, um, by all means attend to your duties, action in which you are not emotionally involved and which is beneficial and does not cause suffering will not bind you. You may 
uh, be engaged in several directions and work with enormous zest, yet remain inwardly free and quiet, with a mirror-like mind which reflects all without being affected. This is a quote this from quote. Nisarga Nisargadatta. Yes, it's another quote from Nisargadatta. And it is another beautiful description because he actually says that, you know, like being completely unengaged or neutral and yet engaged in all the duties and actions. So it, it is a description. It isn't a prescription that you should engage in your duties because there is no you to engage in the duties. But as a description, it's quite beautiful. The actions that don't cause suffering won't bind you. The suffering is the identification as a separate entity. That is the binding action. So without that identification, anything, just like Julia was talking about the bird. Bird doesn't have any concept about needing to fly or needing to come back elsewhere or anywhere. Or taking revenge. Oh, yeah. Takes me away. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Linda. Mm. Anyone? Maybe some. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, poem by Basho, Zen poet. Spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Sitting, sorry, it's a bit low. Doing nothing. Spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Sitting silently. Doing nothing. Spring comes and the grass grows by.
relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Those, the, those Zen poets, they've got their, they got away. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. And Tanya says, beautiful, Kavisha. Thank you. And Debra also says, thank you. Love listening. <laughs> so I don't have a question, but I'm sure if I start speaking, then I'll end up wondering about something. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm finding, I guess, uh, about the, you know, there is no ego, really. It's an illusory, temporal kind of thing, concept. concept. Yeah. But while we appear or apparently believe in it, or believe ourselves to be it, it feels, or the sense is that it's kind of, you know, an individual or experiencing something. Mm -hmm. And I guess if we have a, or if there's an idea that there's maybe some place that we can reach, then, you know, called enlightenment or, or something, then the fear is that we'll never reach that place. And that's why maybe this, I've kind of been coming here because some part of the system or structure that's the body mm -hmm. kind of feels like as long as what's said about this experience is experienced by a, an apparent separate self, or as long as it's pointed to in a way that kind of can concede to the fact, or not the fact, but the concept of time, like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I'll work until I get something, you know? Yeah. I guess on the relative level, you can talk about that and say, okay, well, you know, I'll go to um, mm. get a job and I'll save money or something like that. But uh, when we're trying to understand maybe or question what the deepest truth is mm -hmm. that we can understand or that that can it can be known by by or mm. through the expression of a vehicle mm. um, you can only point to what's happening or like mm. in this moment and I'm, that's kind of, I'm trying to get that to make sense, but, you know, so. Yeah, see, th this is called non-conceptual awareness. Yeah. It is a direct experience of existence right in this moment, not through the concept, not through the concept that I have existence or I am existence. No, it's direct, undeniable fact of existence that you can't deny. You can't deny your being. You can't deny your presence. It's direct. It doesn't need to go to the head, find words, and come back and express it as me having something, experiencing something right now or in future. Or, you know, it doesn't need that. It's direct. Everything else that you talk about, you know, the apparent ego, well, call it ego, call it body mind, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that one is going to age or it's going to find a job or it's not going to. This is not you, it is the vehicle. So you can say vehicle lives by the rules of the dream. It belongs to the dream and it will stay in the dream until its time is exhausted. So in the relative terms of the dream, you can talk about it. But if you want to talk about the truth, truth is direct, immediate, and is experienceable right now without need for concept. Is the, you're not unaware. In, you, you are, there is no, you are not, uh, how you call it, Bob? You know, unaware, and what was the other one? Having to be? Yeah, you're not, uh, you, you aren't unaware. What was the other one? You, <laughs> anyone is not existing right now. You're not, not existing right now. Are mm. you not existing? Mm. You can't say you're not existing. Mm. If you try, try and stop existing for a moment, just, just to give yourself a, a little shot, to just, just to make sure that that's not in your heart, to stop existing, just for now can't do that, can you? You can't stop being. So being is immediate and is direct. 
And you don't need words when you were born as a little baby. That being was already present and known directly. The child doesn't have to learn words for that consciousness to lead it, its eyes. So this is the final truth. But now the mind steps into the picture and creates an image that no, there is a me and final truth is something else, is something out there that I need to achieve and get for myself. A lot of separation, a lot of division. And pain as well. And absolutely. Yeah. That all comes from conceptualizing and believing in concepts. And you're right, if you believe you are an ego, you're going to experience it. You may ask Julia, she believed at some point she was the queen of the universe. How, how did it feel? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, fantastic. You know, the, the people who, who feel that they are unworthy of living and they take their lives. <laughs> they are people who, uh, that's, the, that's the belief. The belief, you know, they, they were people. Bob often points to that example, who believed that Earth was flat. And there was no concept of building a ships and sailing to the other uh, hemisphere because they would believe they will fall off the edge. So that's how debilitating believing in concepts can be, how limiting it can be. But the truth is known directly. It is to be recognized. It doesn't have to be achieved because there is no one to achieve it. It's just that if you look through the mind, it feels like it's not significant enough. The fact that I am present and I am not unaware and I am not non-existent, it feels like, yeah, whatever, so what? Where is my ecstasy? Where is my orgasm? Where is my bliss? I want a pleasure. I want a happiness, which is pleasure. Who is the I who wants something else than this moment? Who is the I who overlooks the most incredible miracle of existence itself? which, you know, without that, there would be absolutely nothing. The existence is a base, and it's largely overlooked just because we use the dualistic mechanism which divides and separates to see the non-duality, the truth. But if you drop to the heart and you feel that radiance, that brilliance of existence directly, fully, how nourishing, how incredible it is, that one will take second place. Won't be that important. This is just a distraction. It's just a mechanism to distract from the obviousness of existence, a miracle of it. Just see it for what it is. It's a tool. It's a noisemaker. It's a helpful tool. It's an incredible instrument. But it is not for that job. It's never going to amount to anything in non-duality because it's a it is a duality creator. It's brilliant. Without that duality creator, nothing would be experienced. It's to be bowed down and loved, but it's not to be trusted. At least in that matter. Julia, do you want to say something? I was just going to say, I guess in that moment, there was a, there was a believing um, in this, that the, uh, in this, fictitious character that could be something. And um, I really, I just love that pointer of the false cannot stand up to investigation. Because um, there's a difference between the stupidity and insanity. Mm -hmm. um, it was absolutely an insanity. <laughs> <laughs> but not incredibly stupid. There was, an un there, was also, there was the memory of, oh yeah, well, Buying into this, fair enough. Maybe it's real. Let's take a look. You don't have anything to hide if it's if you really think this is true. And so there was a looking. And then there was a seeing. You know, but the if you if you look, can you find the one who can blah 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 be or become anything? If there was, there was, uh, when in that looking, there was, there was uh, anytime it's, I, I look there, I could never find anyone. And uh, there you are, you're back to here. Um, and and, and the, the false is, when it seemed to be false, the truth reveals itself. That's all. Mm, yeah, beautiful. And we have Gilbert. 
Uh, and Cassie also was saying beautiful for the song. And Gilbert says, uh, all knowledge is dead. How is this known? The activity of knowing is ever fresh. And this cannot be found in memory. The me of memory is a fiction. And Cliff says, thank you all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the everything that is. Um, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Uh, I, do we have time? Like we have. Yeah, a couple of minutes. Okay. Go for, go for Forty-five it. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's weird though because, like, a person can say, and experience. I don't experience a me. I don't experience an identity or a personal self, but. A body or someone can also say, oh, I feel like I'm still suffering and or mm -hmm. I'm experiencing something I would rather not. Or, mm -hmm. um, That's when you're going to practice non-resistance. Mm. <laughs> and then you'll see what happens to your suffering. Mm. So, yeah. It's a bit a weird kind of dual thing because I think um, sometimes people can get into the the kind of pattern of being like of kind of saying, you know, like I I don't I don't I don't get it, and then I can say to them, well, you do get it because you're you're not unaware. You are it. Or you are it. Mm. Um, for example, a friend of mine, but he's but he would respond with saying, Yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't help the relative world or that doesn't you know Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. This is this is not a manipulation tool. This is not non duality. The wisdom of the final truth or realization is not a tool in the hands of a psychopath to make a dream a better place. <laughs> Mm. It's not. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have all the all the uh, psychopaths using it mm. against you. It is not a magic wand which will change the dream. It is the realization that you are not. You are in the dream as a body mind, but you are not of the dream as the essence. The dream is happening within what you are. Mm. So it isn't, uh, people often say, oh yeah, okay, I know there's no self, so why don't I lose weight? Or why don't I get a boyfriend or something? This is, you know, can, can you see the absurdity of it? It's Putting coming it, yeah. toward it, I, oh, I know there's no self, and then the self coming back in and saying, well, I can use that yeah, to exactly. then become something. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And then if you, if you talk about the uh, resistance, you know, if you realize that really there is no one there, but yet there is still resistance towards cold or hot, you know, look out in nature. There is a resistance, absolutely. Mm. You know, take that, pull the, uh, not too hard, the cat's tail. <laughs> you, you will see he'll resist it, I guarantee you, or she, both mm. of them. The, que the, the difference is there is no resistance to, uh, to arising resistance. Yeah. When the resistance is what arises, hey. It is perfectly what arises. Yeah. And the idea that it shouldn't arise is not being resisted. It's just moved aside. That is also what arising. I have preference for pleasure. That's what arising. There is this pleasure right now. I don't like it. That's what arising. Maybe the action will arise from it or maybe not. But there is no objection even to the resistance. And that which doesn't object to the resistance is your true essential nature. Does that mean the resistance plays out still, or? Of course, yeah, to try and pull that cut. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Move the not, <laughs> not, not too hard, not too hard. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, so resistance absolutely mm. arises. I mean, she can get cold, she can get hot, she can get hun hungry, S and she'll resist it. Okay, final question <laughs> then, because if I believe I'm the one, if I, I'm this body and I'm doing things, then inbuilt in that is the 
okay, this feel this is better, this is worse. And mm-hmm. sometimes it feels like, okay, uh, there can be a resonating with truth, or the truth resonating, and that can be expressed here. Mm. But then at other times, seemingly out of out of like a uncon uh, unconsciousness, you could call it. Of course, there's no unconsciousness really, but but the hidden aspects, yeah. Mind distracts you. You know, the resonance is a natural thing that mm. is something that you knew as a baby, and then you kind of trained yourself to be constantly distracted by that entertaining. Uh, center here mm. the thinking the projecting the you know analyzing computing so the distraction is what obscures that natural uh, amazement of being and the curiosity of being so yes sometimes the clouds are very heavy and dense and sometimes there are no clouds but sky is never obscured but some of those clouds may say oh this is me this is I and then it's the suffering. Then there is investigation. Oh, is it really? Am I really? And when you see that you're not, bah, relaxation again. Thank you. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bob. Thank, Thank you, you, Bob. Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you,